Thank you, David Alm, and welcome to worship, San Inez Valley Presbyterian Church. We see a lot of you outside on this beautiful fall day. Is that Frank Mueller playing Frisbee? Amazing. And those of you who are at home, thank you for joining us. Next week, we will be moving our worship outside and praying each week for weather, as we, but we do need our rain, of course. Let us stand and begin our worship with He Knows My Name. As we have our call to worship. He does know our name. He does know us. He knows um, that we were coming this morning and is already blessing us by the power of His Spirit. Our call to worship is from our sermon passage today, brief portion of it, Matthew 21, 13. We're going to be talking about prayer for a little bit here. It is written, He said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, and we'll continue with what a friend we have in Jesus. to care. 
And a few verses of stand up and bless the Lord as we're still standing for just a minute more. Good morning, church. Today we're going to be talking about the New City Catechism, question 38. What is prayer? Prayer is pouring out our hearts to God in praise and petition, confession of sin, and thanksgiving. Let's go bit by bit. First, prayer, a praise, sorry, praise, to worship, to give honor to God we're going to be requesting for things from. Exodus 15, 2. The Lord is our strength and our defense. He has become our salvation. He is our God, and we will praise him. A petition to request or to appeal to God. Ask God to open or your eyes to all his blessings and to give you a fresh spirit of gratitude. Philippians 4.13, Lord, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Confession. I believe that 1 John 1.9 says it best. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness, unrighteousness. Let go and let God. And thanksgiving, heartfelt gratitude. Psalm 107, 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And Psalm 95, 2. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and a song as we are doing. Prayer is really going before God, who sees everything, before we bow down before him. Take time. Sit in the presence of the Lord. Think on him. Listen to him. You'll feel that peace that passes all understanding. Cast all your cares upon him. He loves you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Amen. Amen. And you can stand again as we sing about our identity in Jesus. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Know oh, his love for me. Yes, yeah, his love for me. The sun sets free oh he's sweet indeed singing I'm a child of God yes I am free at last free at last he has ransomed me his grace runs deep well I was a slave to sin Jesus died for our children across uh, the sanctuary and across the airways. Good morning, children. I wish you were up here with me today, but you're all listening. And 
it's really fun time of year because there's pumpkins everywhere. And God has created these amazing fruits, according to botanists, that um, they are made of 90% water. And kind of like our bodies are made of 80% water. So it's like a fruit of Jesus here. And when we open up those pumpkins, we see that there's a bunch of ooey, slimy, yucky stuff inside. And it reminds me of us. Sometimes we have so much sin and yucky and goo in us that we need to ask for forgiveness. And Jesus is there to give us that forgiveness. Just like Jesus came into the temple and merchants and money goers were in there stealing and doing things they shouldn't do, Jesus would forgive them. He was angry, but we always ask for that forgiveness. And so many times that we do things at school or at home, but all we need to do is ask for the goodness, ask Jesus to forgive the yuckiness in us. And a little fun fact here is that um, Illinois is one of the top pumpkin producers in the United States, which I thought was kind of fun to share with everybody. And um, there's over 800 million of these sold every year in the month of October. And God made these, just like God made us. So ask for forgiveness for your sins. Clean out your pumpkin, shine the light, and God will be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. How y'all out there doing? All right. Good to see you from afar. Well, good morning, everyone. It's not so much how we feel this morning, it's about what we know this morning. Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that even during this coronavirus that he desires to be with us and that he's still in control, even though we have to adjust in the way that we hold worship services sometimes, the Lord is with us and the Lord is ever present. I say these words to encourage us that we are at this time of our history, at this time of our um, nation. We are the light of the world because Jesus has created us to be the light of the world. And in the darkness, the light shines. And so I want to encourage us this morning as we continue our study in the book of Matthew to allow God's word to penetrate our lives, to allow God's word to infiltrate the deepest part of who we are, so that we might be the light that he's called us to be during this time. I'd invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 21. If you don't have a Bible, it will be up on the screen. But let's read together. Matthew 21, starting in verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 12. Jesus entered the temple area and drove all out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. And he left them and went out, to the city of, went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this word. We do thank you for the, the knowledge that you give to us as we open your word by the power of your spirit who enlightens our hearts and our minds. We ask this morning that we might take stock of our own lives as we see this example of Jesus cleansing the temple and how it applies to our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not springtime. But many of us know what spring cleaning is like. 
And now it's not springtime, but you have six months to think about what your spring cleaning might look like. I remember when I was growing up, um, you hear the saying, cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, with my mother, cleanliness was godliness. And during springtime, we would make it a point to make sure that everything was cleaned, everything was picked up and put in its right place. We'd make extra efforts to clean the windows, make extra effort to clean the grout in the bathroom, to clean all the things that needed to be cleaned out. I can remember, I have distinct memories of my mom with a bucket of Lysol and those yellow plastic gloves that she would wear to go around in the scrub brush, to go in the bathrooms and scrub the kitchen and scrub the tile all over the place. Spring cleaning. It's a time to reflect. It's a time to let the winter go by and the spring sunshine to shine in and enlighten everything in our homes so that we feel and know that our houses are clean. Jesus has been coming into the temple. He's been coming into Jerusalem, and we looked at last week how he entered into Jerusalem, and the children were singing, Hosanna to the Son of David. And people were laying palm branches on the ground and coats on the ground as he rode in on a donkey, on the foal of a donkey. And as he came in, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders were aghast at who he was. And the, the whole city of Jerusalem was a, up in air, up in arms on, who is this guy? Who is this guy that's coming in on a donkey proclaiming to be a king as, as they proclaim to be a king? Well, it turns out that Jesus is on a mission. He's on a mission, and his mission, mission takes a couple of stages. The first stage that it takes is that he enters into the temple itself. He enters into the very house of God. And what does he do? He cleanses the temple. He claims authority over the temple. He claims that this is his house, that my house was to be a house of prayer. In John's gospel, he says, my father's house is to be a house of prayers. So he claims ownership of the very temple itself. Now, the temple is an interesting place because it, it has many different areas which, regard, which we regard as the temple. Now, the most inner part of the temple we recognize is the Holy of Holies, where the priest would go in once a year to make sacrifice, atoning sacrifice for the nation of Israel. The next area was called the holy place or the, co the court of the priests. And in that court of the priests, you would see the altar of, uh, of burnt offering and the altar of incense, and the candelabra, the seven-branched candelabra, and the table with the bread on it, and the big laver, the big bowl to wash for ceremonial washings. And this was the area of the temple where the priests would do their duties. They would do what the priests were called to do. The next court, exter exterior to that, was called the court of the Israelites. And in the court of the Israelites, is where the temple worship services would take place. So many times when we hear of Jesus going to the temple to teach, he would be in this, temp, this part of the, the, the temple called the court of the Israelites. And here only Israeli men, only Jewish men were allowed to come. And the next court beyond that was called the court of the women. And the court of the women was obviously the place where the Jewish women were able to come and worship. They would separate the men and the women. And then the final court was the court of the Gentiles. And the court of the Gentiles was this outer court where anybody could come that wasn't Jewish and partake, partake or at least observe and take part in worship and in praise and in prayer. And it was a place where they could observe and engage in the, in the religion to see if they could find God there. And many people would come, especially during the Passover, because it was a time when people would be able to observe the highlight or the high holy days of the Jewish religion. And it is this outer court that Jesus comes. It is this place where people are gathering, supposedly to be able to worship, supposedly be able to draw close to God, supposedly to be able to understand what it meant to follow the one true God. But what does he find? He finds a flea market, an environment of bustle and hustle, an environment where animals are being sold and money is being exchanged. 
In John's gospel, we realize that animals are being sold. Not only were doves being sold for sacrificial sacrifices for the poor, but also lambs were being sold and cows were being sold for worship, sacrifices. And there wasn't so much the fact that things were being sold there because there was things that in the outside, in the city itself in Jerusalem, there were vendors that were able to sell these, uh, these sacrificial animals to people that would come. Now, the reason why they would sell them is because the people that would come would come from a long distance away. And it was impractical for them to bring their sacrificial animal with them. And not only was it impractical for them to bring it necessarily, but they would have to get it okayed by the priest before it was received as a right kind of a sacrifice. And so it would have been a kind of a bummer for them to bring their animal from wherever they came from to the priest. And the priest said, no, that one's no good. You got to go buy one down, down over here in the outer court from the vendors. And the reason why they would do that is because they would hike up the prices of the animals. They would extort their own people. They would extort the people to buy the sacrificial animals and make a lot of money. And there was a bazaar called the Bazaar of Annas. And if you remember that Annas at those days was the chief priest. So not only were there vendors there that were selling animals for sacrifice, but there were money changers there as well. And you might ask, well, why do they need money changers in a temple? Well, you come to find out that the money changers in the temple were to exchange the different currencies that were outside of Jerusalem, that were outside of the temple area, because they would only receive money in the temple money that they, that they had established. And so if I came with Roman money, I would have to get it exchanged in order to pay the, 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 the spring temple tax, but also to be able to buy the sacrificial animals in their marketplace. And as you can imagine, the exchange rate was horrendous. The exchange rate was out of this world, and the temple took total advantage of the people that would come. And this is kind of the environment that Jesus is finding himself. He's finding himself in an environment that the temple, the place of God's worship, the temple that people are able to come and find God, became a marketplace, a place for, pri or for arrogance, a place for um, greed and, and sin. And they would allow these things to take place, and the priests were the ones that were getting the most out of it. You remember a week ago when we talked about Judas Maccabeus, who defeated Antiochus, Anti Antiochus I can't pronounce that, Epiphanes um, in 175 BC when he came and cleansed the temple and the people rode in and get put down uh, branches for Maccabees. And this is the same thing that's happening here. Jesus comes into the temple and the people thinking that he is the one who is going to free them from the Romans and he comes into the temple just like, just like Maccabees did and cleansed the temple. So the people's anticipation of him rises but he's come again to defeat another kind of enemy, a more difficult enemy, a more severe enemy, the enemy of sin and death as he's coming and his mission to hang on the cross for our sins. And so what does Jesus do? Without permission, without asking the priest, hey, do you think it's okay if I go into the temple court? And uh, in John's gospel, he says he makes a whip and he turns over the tables. In Luke's gospel, it says that he wouldn't even let merchants bring their goods into that area that he was chasing them out. He didn't ask for permission. He didn't ask for warning. He didn't give any warning. He just came in and exploded on the people and kicked them out. When people come to faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus has a mission. Have you heard the saying that Jesus loves you no matter what? He loves you for just who you are. That's a fallacy. Jesus doesn't love us for who we are. Jesus loves us in spite of who we are. He loves us in spite of the fact that we have sin in our lives. He, lo he re loves us in spite of the fact that we're rebellious. He loves us in spite of the fact that we do not follow his ways. So when a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit enters that person's life and begins to do a process of cleaning the temple. We call it discipleship. We call it leading a life of holiness. 
He doesn't just come alongside and we just say, hey, well, I've got Jesus in my life and everything's going to be good. I'm going to get everything I want. I'm going to get everything I need. I'm going to just be a better person. No, Jesus has a, a desire for your life to be holy, a desire for your life to follow him in his ways according to the scriptures. And that's why Jesus came to clear the temple because the temple was being abused. The temple was not being used for what he called for. And so he kicks out the money changers. He kicks out the merchants that are selling. But why didn't anybody stop him? I think they were shell-shocked, to tell you the truth. It's pretty unusual that a person's going to come into the temple and start cleaning house. I think he's a prophet, that people recognize the fact that he was a prophet. And prophets do kind of awkward and unusual things, if you look back in the Old Testament and read about the prophets of the Old Testament and how they would portray themselves, and they were noted for different aspects of their life that caused people to, be, to take, a, take notice of them as they judged them. And, and Jesus right here is symbolizing the fact that he's judging these people by kicking them out, by removing them from the temple. Also, the people themselves well, probably would have rioted if the religious leaders tried to kick, kick him out because the people were just enthralled with Jesus, just loved what he was doing and took total advantage of the fact that he was becoming really popular. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders were beside themselves. He had a mission, but he also had a ministry. In verse 14, Jesus we are reminded that how Jesus, once those people were kicked out, and Jesus again begins to minister to people. The blind and the lame come to Jesus for healing. And I find that very interesting to realize that Jesus could have told them, you know what, I'm just too angry right now. I just don't have time. I'm kind of taken up with this whole deal, and, and I, I just can't really heal you guys right now. But his compassion, again, is shown we have a loving, compassionate God and that when we come to him, no matter what he's going through, he takes notice of your pain and your suffering. And when we come for him for healing and when these come for him to him for healing, he steps aside and he heals them and ministry is taking place once again. You see, once those things were cleaned out, once those people were cleared out, ministry was able to take place once again. The temple was cured and people were able to be healed and when they were healed, the children began to sing. Here Jesus again, the third time in three chapters, he highlights the children. Remember how he talked about the children, let the children come, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you want to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to come in childlike manner remembering that it is by that way of looking to Christ in childlikeness that we are saved and that we are able to come into his presence. Matthew Henry writes this, proud men cannot bear that honor should be done to anyone but themselves. And that's what the Pharisees were like. When Jesus came and people honored them, they couldn't stand it because the people were addressing him and honoring him and gave them, him, the joy of their celebration. And as the children shouted out, Hosanna to the son of David, the scriptures tell us that the Pharisees became indignant. They were beside themselves. They couldn't handle it anymore. And they were looking for ways to do away with him, but the people kept getting in the way. And this is what Jesus said that they were doing. He said, my house, my father's house, was a house for the nation, for prayers for the nations. Luke's gospel reminds us that this is a house of prayer for the nations. And as we were reminded by Karin earlier, that prayer takes place when we engage in the holy God and he allows us to enter into his presence. We were talking in the men's uh, Bible study on Thursday about this. And we were using the analogy acts that prayer is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Adoration that we adore God. We come into his presence in adoring him. 
We come into his presence, as we've learned this morning, to confess our sins to him. We learn to give thanks to him. And we learn to ask for things. But I want to add one more letter. It's Acts, A-C-T-S, and one more S. And that letter S is surrender. That when we come into the very presence of God, not only do we adore him, not only do we thank him, not only do we confess our sins, not only do we supplicate or we ask him for things, but true prayer is surrendering ourselves to the Lord. We're reminded how Jesus prayed to his father before going to the cross, Lord, if it's your will, take this cup from me. But then he says, it's not my will, but it's your will. So prayer, a house of prayer, this place we call a a worship place, outside where we're worshiping this morning, is that place of surrender. Wherever you're at this morning with the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a place to surrender to his loving care. The people were healed. The children celebrated. They're able to, once again, come into the very presence of God without those hindrances to take place in our lives. Now, how do we apply this to our lives? Well, I think we apply it to our lives in three different ways three different sections. The first, we apply it to our lives personally or individually. When Jesus comes into your life, are you willing to let him clean house? If Jesus were to approach you this morning and say, these are the areas that I would like to address in your life, would you be willing to repent and turn and say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to surrender? I'm willing for your spirit to come and convict me of the sin of my life so that I might yield those to you, so that I might surrender to you, so that you might heal that area of my life, so that I might live a life more holy, a life that you've called me to. If Jesus were to come into our life, would he say, you know what, you're spending just enough time with me? Or would he say, where were you this morning? when you promised to be with me? Where were you last night before you went to bed when you told me you would meet with me? Where were you when you said I would read your word and let your scriptures penetrate my life as the psalmist says, I will enjoy and I will celebrate and I will love your word and I will let your word be my guide. See, like the religious leaders of Jesus' day, we too become complacent at times. We too become, take things for granted. We too let things slide. We too let things in our lives, like the temple, let the money changers into their lives. We let sin into our lives and it deludes our walk with the Lord. And Jesus is wanting for us to yield those things to him. Do we ignore the promptings that he gives us every day? You know those promptings. You know those times when you're doing something that you probably shouldn't be doing that would displease the Lord, and the Lord is quietly whispering in your ear or shouting loudly in your ear. In your ear. Maybe this isn't what you should be about. Teenagers, who are you hanging out with as friends determines a lot of who you are. Bad company corrupts good morals. Who are you hanging out with? Who are we allowing entering into our lives, not only as young people, but as adults as well? You see, the outer court was a place where people were able to come to worship, to hear God's word, and yet they were being kept from that. Our lives are like those outer courts where people are engaging our lives to see if they see in us Christ to see in us the reality of what it means to be a Christian. The second area that I think this applies to is our families. Our family now is being uh, being attacked more so than ever before. The nuclear family in our culture today is being attacked. And how do we stand up to that attack? More now than ever do we need households who are focused and centered on the Word of God, that are focused and centered on worshiping the Lord as family, that are focused and centered of reading God's word together, praying together, 
singing together as families. A challenge for us as parents, mothers, and fathers, do we take seriously the responsibilities that the Lord has given us by taking spiritual leadership and guiding our families in discipleship to raise the next generation to follow Christ and be a light to the world for their generation? The challenge is difficult. The challenge is great. And the need is greater still. Are we modeling biblical leadership in our own homes, guiding our families to love the Lord with all of our hearts and with all of our minds and with all of our strength? Or we spend more time teaching our families and being more involved in our world, the economic situation exploding into our own lives by making ourselves feel better about ourselves by our financial portfolio or whether we're engaged in the latest things of technology or whether we're being accepted by a culture that dilutes the power of God in their lives. Today is a day where we as husbands and wives, grandmoms and granddads, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, rally together to raise families so that the next generation might know and be able to share the love of Christ together. Last week, we had a number of baptisms, and those baptisms include a number of young children. And those young children, we promised to pray for them. We promised to engage them. We promised to help them grow. The next one is, of course, the church family. How would the Lord lead us? How do we stay true to the scriptures as our final authority in life and witness? Do we strive to present every man, woman, and child mature in Christ? Do we stay true to our code of values of passionate worship, rich discipleship, authentic fellowship, and respectful evangelism, and sacrificial service? Are we a community of faith that invites people and connects people and celebrates God and equips people to serve in the name of Jesus? Are we holding on to our true mission to grow this church to be a flourishing church that make disciples of Jesus Christ? Or are we allowing worldly influences to dilute and to minimize the witness that God would have us have? And do we seek after business practices that promote greed and selfishness as opposed to gaining faith and faithful biblical stewardship. These are challenging times. It's time to step up. It's time for the Christian community to be courageous. Jesus has come and cleansed the temple. He desires to come and clean our hearts, to make us holy, to make us righteous, so that we can stand strong in a culture that desires to put us down and to drag us through the muck and the mire. The good news is that greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. You have the power through the power of Jesus Christ to live a life that is pleasing to him, to be able to sacrifice, as our, our scriptures tell us in Romans chapter 12, that we are to be living in holy sacrifices to the Lord so that his will would be done. Finally, verse 17 might seem like an inconsequential verse. Jesus said in verse um, 14, I've got to get my glasses out. Jesus said in verse 16, excuse me, or they said in verse 16, do you hear these children sing? And they asked him, and Jesus said, yes, replied Jesus, I hear them crying out, Hosanna, son of David. And then he says, have you never heard from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. That was his message to them, that even in infants and children ordained praise to God and praise to Jesus Christ. And at that message, he didn't say anything more. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Now, like I said, that might seem like an inconsequential verse. He left them and then went out to the city. But it reminds me, God is patient. 2 Peter 3.9 reminds us that, that God is patient and he, just, and he desires that none should perish. But God's patience isn't eternal. He left them for their own devices. 
Those who will not have Christ, who keep denying Christ, God's patience will run out. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation, that if you hear his voice, come to him today. The, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders kept looking for ways to do away with Jesus. The people and the children reminded us that we need to receive him. The passage warns us of his final withdrawal, his final day of judgment. It will come. And when he does, his life and light to those who reject him will be gone. So may us, as those that follow Jesus Christ and love him, may we be like the blind and the deaf and the ones and the lame that needed healing. May we, those that have been received Christ, may we rejoice in the goodness of our God. May the world see within us as the children sang and shout, Hosanna to the Son of David. May the world see within us the joy of our salvation. And I think 1 Corinthians 15, 58 reminds us very well, and I'll close with this. It says, therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work in the Lord will not be without, will be, will, knowing that you, you know, the work of the Lord will stand and not be in vain. Therefore, be immovable. Be strong. Be courageous. Let the word of God dwell in you richly so that you can stand in such a day as this. Be light to the light, to the darkness of our world. Let God's love guide you as you seek and to serve him. Cleaning the temple is good for us because it allows people to see the truth of God in and through us. May we allow our light to shine for his name. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, for your passage that you've laid upon us this morning. How you desire us to have an unhindered relationship with you. That you desire us, Lord, to be clean. That you desire for us, Lord, to acknowledge our sin before you, to allow your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us. That we live a life that is um, a full of your love and your grace as we have received your salvation and forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for each person who hears these words that God loves them. God loves them in spite of themselves and desires for them to become more holy and pure. God loves them so much that he's willing to invest his life, to die on the cross for us that we might have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. May that truth ring in our lives each day. Amen. Sure, sure, the 
in us, the mind of Christ in us. Lord, you awaken us by the power of your spirit to absorb this word today of your love for us, of the importance of prayer, of the importance of a clean house. Lord, we thank you that we can praise you, we can adore you, that we can be thankful before you. We thank that we can petition to you and we thank you that we can surrender to you. These things you've called us to do in prayer. And additionally, Lord, we need to confess. We're going to take this time to confess. As we do our own spring cleaning individually during this time, we lay our hearts before you in our minds, and we become aware by the power of your Spirit those places that we have failed you, that we have missed the mark, that we have fallen short individually, maybe in our homes, maybe in our communities. And you, you say this is a house of prayer for all nations, Lord, maybe even in praying for others far away for our nation. How we failed you, Lord, and as your spirit draws us close, as we've heard this wonderful word, we are broken before you, we surrender and we talk to you right now as we confess our sin to you.
And Lord, we do at this time, we lift up uh, the Burks, certainly Pat. We pray that you would touch her and heal her right now. Give Sam a sense of peace uh, that passes understanding as he's not able to see his wife. Make them strong in you, Lord, and the great witness that they are to this community. We lift up Maggie's granddaughter, who is in hospice, not able to walk or talk, but knows you, Lord Jesus, and we praise you for that. Hold her fast, Lord, as you are with her in these days, and be with Maggie. Be with Maggie and Joe. And uh, again, give them that peace that passes understanding from knowing you. Lord, we thank you for hearing our confession. And if uh, you have, have touched us, if we are faithful to confess, you are just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and forgive us, Lord. And we thank you. As we pray together, the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue to worship, let us continue to worship in the giving of our tithes and our offerings this morning, recognizing the fact that the Lord has blessed us so greatly so that we might give according to what he's called us to give so that we might bless others in response to his giving towards us. So let us continue to worship in the giving of our tithes and our offerings. We're going to sing this together. Shall 
going to have you stand, but it's probably better if you sit so you can see the, the monitor for the words. Church outside. Again, next week we will be building uh, all of us here to be outside with you, weather permitting. And uh, next week, Advent starts. How exciting. We'll have our wreath readings. We've got wreath readers uh, with uh, the Advent wreath. And then also following the following week on the 6th, on December 6th, we'll be hosting our uh, Advent workshop and then also a live stream Christmas concert from uh, Andrew Peterson, the writer of Is He Worthy? It's called Behold the Lamb. I'd like to watch that video a minute, if you can get up on the screen, Dave, because... Story is the language I think God wired all of our hearts to speak. Like, everybody resonates with stories. That's how our hearts learn and experience things. Um, and so God is telling us a story all of the Bible being having this narrative flow to it, all of creation having a direction that it is moving toward, right? Story is movement from one place to another. And that's, that's like at the heart of Behold the Lamb of God because the gospel story is the perfect story. I usually tell people it's a concert that tells a story. I, I'm all, I always want to clarify to people that it's not a musical, it's not a play, it's just a concert. So sing with joy for the brave little boy Um, and it was, it's a, it's a Christmas concert, but you could actually play the concert at any time of year and it would work because really it's just about the need for and coming of a savior to the, to the world. And that happens to be the Christmas story. So again, that'll be December 6th with the Advent Workshop starting at 5. And I did want to tell you folks.